but like what? Like, no, no, no way. This is a horrible. This oh. is a horrible <laughs> oh, abomination. You don't like it. I'm no. shocked. I am shocked. Leslie, I oh. thought you were in. Yeah, me I too. I was like, no in. what? No more. This... No more sweat. <laughs> Everyone, and welcome to Another Bite, the show where we rewatch some of the greatest and, well, some of the most intriguing pitches from Shark Tank. I'm Jory, and I'm joined by John Dick. Hey. And Leslie Green. Hey, y'all. Dream team right here. So today in the Shark Tank, we're going to give you something to really sink your teeth into. But before we get into that, a quick word from today's sponsor. You know it, we know it. Next year is creeping up quick. If you want to win inside your niche in 2024, you need tech that puts you in the pilot seat. The new HubSpot Sales Hub will help you close out the year strong and kickstart your success in 2024. Teams can collaborate on every inch of the customer journey and keep operations running smoothly with comprehensive prospecting workspace and powerful sales analytics tools that keep data connected across teams. And with over 1,400 integrations, there's a ton of ways to mix in new features. So finish out Q4 strong and gear up for the new year with HubSpot Sales Hub. Learn more at HubSpot.com forward slash sales. First up in our tank, we have Snackdiv. So the problem it's trying to solve is that snacking gets messy. You know, you're working from home a lot and you've got cheese puff dust everywhere. How are you supposed to navigate between licking your fingers and typing on your keyboard? So Snackdiv is a device that installs between the pointer finger and your middle finger. So it sort of looks like a tiny pair of chopsticks that hook onto your hand. And this is the invention of Kevin and Edwin. They come to us with Snackdiv asking for a $200,000 investment for a 10% stake, which is a $2 million valuation. So thinking about our pitch and our product, what are some of our initial thoughts? Well, first, it looks like a baby shark. And I just have to say that. (laughs) It looks like a baby shark. Um, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with this product. I want to try it. As somebody who gets maybe like a five minute break between meetings and I am going to out myself and say that I eat at my desk more than I'm proud of. And when I look down and see something that I've done, I'm just really horrified by the mess that I've made. (laughs) I really want to try this. So I don't know, John, where are you on? Where are you on the the baby shark snack? I hate the snack, Tim. This is a fake. Of course you do. This is so. Okay. (laughs) Leslie. Aren't you you eating right now? I, I, I am eating Don't right you now. wish you had an easy utensil? Do you, do you know what I have next to me? It's called a napkin, okay? And I wipe mm. my hands off before I touch my keyboard or other valuable things in my life. My, here's my problem. I've got a couple problems. <laughs> Number one, what an awful name. I don't have any. It sounds like a tech startup for snacking, not a mm. pair of chopsticks. And they had a lot of name opportunities that they missed out on. Uh, names such as Edward Snacking Hands. No, no. <laughs> they might get trademarked on that one. You want to get sued? <laughs> Mr. Wonderful suggested Wonder Chop. Okay, he's just a narcissist. What about Snack Sticks? Snack, snack sticks. sticks is cute. Snack, snack sticks. sticks would be great. So number one, they're just coming in with a horrible brand name to start. Number two, the premise that I am supposed to make less of a mess by strapping two sticks to my knuckles and picking up Cheetos between the sticks and getting them in my mouth somehow is a ridiculous idea. I'm gonna drop Cheetos all over the place trying to pick them up between my knuckle sticks. Like this is just, this is ridiculous to me. You Say, can't know until you try. You can't know until you try it. And of course my other issue is this just is never gonna be a business. This is a classic mm. pre-shipping Shark Tank pitch. We see these all the time. They come in, they had a little Kickstarter that a couple people liked because they <laughs> dropped a Cheeto in their laptop. And all of a sudden they're asking for venture investment from sharks. And I just don't think it's ever going to get off the ground. I will say, didn't they say they had $187,000 in sales and then 50,000 international? Yes. And only five months into the venture. Like this is a very new company. It, but it's these are all pre-sales, Leslie. They haven't shipped no, a pair. They, they haven't actually they haven't them. shipped okay. a pair of Edward scissor sticks yet. <laughs> OK, I mean, I hear your practical things. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. But I think there's something here. I did look at it on Amazon because I was curious what people were saying about it. Rave reviews. 
People have said that they have also used it for scratching their dog's head, (laughs) feeling like a baby cyborg, holding a sticky note. I don't know about that, but also snacking and gaming. Mm. I think it's smart. Especially because it's like all about streamlining efficiency, John. Who doesn't want that? Where are you going to store your knuckle sticks? You're going to get it. It has a carrying case. Did you miss that? I think I missed a carrying case. <laughs> this changes everything. That has a carrying case? <laughs> I oh, want it. Okay. Does it come I'm in totally colors? in. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's like seven Cheetos that have dropped between my knuckle sticks onto my keyboard and I'm brushing them off. But I also think that it is an interesting product, especially given the high interest that this product has, you know, in Asia. Like it sounded like the the two founders had a lot of international dealers in it was Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. And I think, you know, for, for someone that like does use chopsticks a lot, I feel like it's it might not actually be such a big jump of like wanting to bring your own portable chopsticks to your fingers. Yeah, we've seen like the reusable straw. I mean, we I don't know if we actually saved all the turtles, but the reusable straw market became really, really big. There are people who take straws and utensils with them. And I think you make a really important point. Jory is just like, that may not have immediately made sense in this cultural context, but in another, it seem, may seem like a no brainer. Look, I think it is very clear that there are some people interested in trying this, which slightly validates the problem. It was upsetting to learn that like Mark Cuban's keyboard was so disgusting that his teenage son, teenage sons are Gross. Amongst the most disgusting human <laughs> beings on the and planet. And his son at any bought time. him a new one. Yeah. I'm such a slob, right? I, I mean, my 12 year old son, Jake, literally just bought me a new keyboard because he wouldn't come down to my computer in my office because he said it was so disgusting. <laughs> and so yeah. his son was like, Dad, this is gross. I'm buying you a new keyboard. Uh, that Learning that about Mark Cuban was very eye opening, and I'll always appreciate this pitch for that. <laughs> but. Uh, I I do think there's clearly some inbound demand here. And sure, maybe this could be a little hobby business. You know, I think it is nice that some of the sharks thought it could be a fun little thing. We're willing to put a little bit of money in. You know, the whole like valuation of the company was all just like largely just like made up. It was like, I guess we'll just like ask for a million dollar valuation and maybe we'll take a couple hundred thousand dollars and just give away a bunch of the company. And maybe together we can sell a bunch of these snack sticks. I felt Kevin Hart brought an entirely different energy to this episode than other episodes. So mm-hmm. can really bring value to this. What's your offer? Uh, well, can you let me get there, Kevin? Stop trying to bully me. Can you let me get there? Stop trying to bully me, please. All right. Okay. How about- it just wasn't as serious. And I really enjoyed it because I was like, yes, Kevin, you're making this fun. You believe in this entrepreneur. It is different. It is out of the ordinary. And then, you know, Lori with all of her QVC connections. I just think the pairing of the sharks who went in together is just another win for these entrepreneurs. Yeah. Quirk works, you know? (laughs) It does. And having Kevin Hart on, I agree, Leslie, was like really different energy. And like, I'm not sure... Like if they knew that Kevin Hart was going to be on, but these entrepreneurs were very wacky and were quirk, very quirky and very funny, in particular, the one who was stuffing his face with food. But he made some interesting choices, like he removed the lenses from his glasses, which <laughs> yeah. was noticed halfway through the pitch. Kevin Hart was like, do you not have lenses in your glasses? It was like a really funny moment. But he had the line of the episode, which was when Barbara made a comment that the story of the mess being made reminded her of her messy husband. Mm-hmm. He replied and he said, <laughs> It was disgusting, right? You might Man. be my next husband. <laughs> I don't have to make a deal here today. I just marry you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, like, right. shot. <laughs> he's shooting a shot at Barbara mid pitch. Yep. I don't think we've ever seen that before. It was so, it was a great line. It was. For that alone, he earned his $200,000. <laughs> so ultimately, Snacktive founders took the Lori and Kevin Hart deal for $200,000 for 20%. And this is actually kind of fun because this was actually Kevin Hart's first deal in the tank ever. So it was quirky, but I feel like that was really on brand for him. Yeah, it was like the battle of the Kevins. And I love how <laughs> Kevin Hart just kept his cool, made it funny, just kind of shut down Mr. Wonderful a number of times. And it was kind of nice to see. So do we think that Snacktive is still a company? I think they are. I think that they have a product that they sell. It may not be a company that I would, as why I would define it. <laughs> but I <laughs> think- you define a company, Jory? <laughs> I think I'm sure they're still selling their Edward Scissor sticks. 
So Snactive is definitely still bringing the treats with no grease, but the company continues to grow. It's expanded now into Singapore and Canada. So they've begun to pair and partner with influencers in the gaming world specifically, which I think Perfect. is like a pretty good demographic, right? <laughs> That's so smart. There's like <laughs> three hour live streams and all people will see is them like doing the snack. It's yeah. <laughs> Next up in the tank, we have a company called Collars & Co. This comes to us from a founder named Justin asking for a $300,000 investment for a 4% stake in his company. So that's $7.5 million in valuation, which I thought was already interesting because I rarely see equity pitches that low that like fly for these sharks. So it's like, have you seen Shark Tank, Justin? Um, but he starts by giving us a lesson in business casual. You know, it's the typical dress shirt under a sweater. He calls it the Midtown Uniform in New York City. There's an entire Instagram account called Midtown Uniform. Please go look at it. <laughs> I, w- I will, because I was just like, yeah, that sounds like something that would exist in New York City. So the problem with the Midtown uniform is apparently, and also, John, let us know, uh, it gets hot and uncomfortable. It's got some floppy collar issues. You got your bunched up sleeves. And so Collars & Co. comes with its newly invented dress collar polo, which is helping guys stay comfortable and remain stylish. Well, Jory, yeah, I have marketed and sold a lot of a lot of high end shirts in my life. Uh, when Tell I us everything. Mar- <laughs> when I worked at marketing at Trunk Club, mm-hmm. uh, if I could rebrand this company, I would call it Collars and No. <laughs> Tell us more. But like what? <laughs> like, no, no, no way. This is a horrible. This oh. is a horrible <laughs> oh, abomination. You don't like it. I'm no. sho- I am shocked. Leslie, I oh. thought you were in. Yeah, me I too. I was like, no in. what? No more. This, no more sweat. <laughs> this is well. Okay, let's let's just break this down a little bit. Here's <laughs> where I'm torn on this. Uh, this is wrong. This is an abomination. It's a Franken shirt. Okay, mm. it is a messed up hybrid pieced together of various parts of men's fashion when the whole point of the Midtown uniform is the layering. Mm. That is the point. It is, you do Mm. want your sleeves at different lengths so that you can see the various textures and patterns contrasting each other. That's what makes the look so wonderful. Aren't there things they're like called like dicky collars? Like I swear that's the name of it, where it's just like a, a collar that you wear under other clothing. My problem is that he is just piecing all of this together into essentially a dicky collar, Jory. You're exactly right. It's pretty much a dicky collar. I don't think anybody would want to be caught wearing that shirt without a sweater on mm. in a million years. I think it is a very strange looking sweater. So all of my men's fashion, my classical sense for what makes a man look good aside, this could actually be a good business because sometimes (laughs) these abominations work. Like there's another abomination in men's fashion that seems to be working very, very well right now, which is this company called Untuck It. I was always taught that you tuck your shirt in. Mm -hmm. That's just what you do. You tuck your shirt in. Don't look like a slob. No French tuck for you. (laughs) I love a French tuck. I'm not going to lie. That is not a man, Leslie. (laughs) This is a fighting episode for me and John, and I kind of love it. Tis not a man. A man tucks his shirt in, I was always taught. But meanwhile, Untuck It uh, had the insight that actually men don't want to tuck their shirt in, uh, either because they don't like the way their their bodies look or they're afraid of looking like too uptight or they want to like look more casual or whatever. And they've gone on to build like an incredible business. I think everyone when Untuck It started was like, you got to have like, I don't know, like an aspirational brand name for your fashion company. And and it's got to like be designed, like you can't just win on like a feature like that about length of shirt. But I think last I saw, they're doing like 300 million a year in revenue. So they're doing very, very well. And so it might actually go on to be a really good company. And his growth numbers are very impressive. And I think he's doing a really good job doing essentially direct to consumer internet marketing to drive a bunch of sales to this. So I might hate it, but I might also choose to invest. Yes. I think this is an opportunity to challenge your antiquated beliefs about men's fashion. I am <laughs> I <love> big <laughs> on functional clothing that is like easy to wear. Like if you have people who are comfortable in it, they're going to come back and keep buying. Like I think about like 
Tommy Johns who like, yeah, they made briefs, but they made them so comfortable that people kept wearing them. Like if you feel good in something, you're going to keep wearing them. And so I would just love to get one of these shirts on John to just see if he is really as against it as he says. Do you want to know a fun fact about me? Yes, I always do. Immediately, yes. Uh, There has not been a day of the pandemic that I have not worn hard pants. Are you kidding me? I wear hard (laughs) pants every single day of my damn life because I look good in hard pants. Great denim. I look good in a lot of things that I don't wear to work. (laughs) I've worn a collar to work every day since this pandemic started up here in the attic every single day. Everyone Mm, on my team I've worn a sweatshirt every day of this podcast. I'm wearing wearing a collared shirt right now. (laughs) I love good classical men's fashion. You know, it's actually really interesting in their marketing. They do a series where they stop men on the streets and have them change. It's genius. I love the the concept, but it's just so interesting because they did. They stopped people in the streets who had that look and then said, hey, try this. And every guy was like, this is super comfortable. I love the way this looks. I feel like I feel more put together. So it is working. OK, so there's two strong opinions on the table, right? I think my question is, is like, who do we think the target demographic for this product is? And like, are they reaching it? Well, So this is what's actually quite interesting. And this actually gets into their business model a bit. And we can leverage some of the insights from my time at Trunk Club on is uh, the price point for this shirt is 65 to 75. Yeah, 70 bucks on average. That that is actually like a lot for a short sleeved collared shirt, uh, I would say. And so they're definitely starting to be up in the like premium men's clothing tier. And one thing that is absolutely true there so there's just a very finite group of people there. That's one of the things mm-hmm. we learned at Trunk Club, actually, is, you know, our initial strategy was to go to market so heavily through Facebook. And it turned out over time, like our cost to acquire customers was just rising because we couldn't expand audience enough. Every time we really tried to expand audience, turned out that uh, we got a lot of people in who weren't willing to spend at that price point. I think it's actually very hard to move men out of the price point band that they think of themselves in. Also, we tried to do that a lot was to take people and be like, it's worth the investment to step up. But it's just like, I think most men, which this is targeted at, have some amount that they're willing to spend on a shirt. And if it's above that, they're just like, I'm not spending that on a shirt. And so this is definitely targeted at a fairly wealthy clientele. Like it's a premium price point. And I think there's just a limited audience for that. I think a lot of those people who are in that premium price point are going to want to wear the really good stuff. Um, They're not going to want to go to some D2C brand that is going to embarrass them in a meeting in front of their boss by that boss realizing that they don't have cuffs sticking out of their sweater. You know, so that happen. I'm just like, I'm shocked. (laughs) I don't know. I feel like as a world, we've gotten more casual, like the pandemic, like brought us back to earth that we don't need to wear the most uncomfortable clothes, wear the most expensive clothes. So I'm just, I'm surprised to hear that, that you think this person would be shunned wearing collared and clothes. You don't need to, Leslie. It's not about need. <laughs> it's I'm about practical, want. John. This is about self-worth and looking freaking good. Okay. That's what it's about. Oh my God. And so if you're going to put a sweater on top of a shirt, my God, you better layer and texture and you better have <laughs> contrasting colors and patterns. You That's know just what? how you look good and feel good. I, I actually want to throw something out that this like midtown uniform, I would like to actually see a little variety. The little collar with a sweater is actually a very kind of boring look in my opinion. Like it's not, it doesn't give a lot of flair. It's not unique. On that, I was kind of like, oh, okay, great. We're going to have more people dressing in Midtown uniform. (laughs) But the people who do are going to look crisp. Mm. Well, so this is the thing. One of his value props is it's a crisp collar. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. called starch. You just... (laughs) You starch your collar. I have never starched a collar in my life. And well, I you're not. not you're like, wearing. You've worn a sweatshirt for four and a half years at this point, John, Leslie. That was harsh. Okay. By the way, Leslie, I agree that the Midtown uniform is freaking boring. Okay. But, so boring. But the solve for that is to innovate, change up your patterns. Make the reason the Midtown uniform is boring is because most people wear boring sweaters and boring shirts. Oh. Not because. A sweater shirt combo is boring. That's Mm. fair. We are getting some hot fashion tips. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Now, here's the issue. So you've now heard my my split direction on this company. I hate it, but maybe I want to invest. Hate to love it. The problem is what he's looking for in evaluation here. And this Mm -hmm. is the sticking point of the whole pitch is how much is this company worth? If I wasn't invested before, 
I definitely wasn't invested after seeing kind of this back and forth. Like there were not enough notes in the world that could help me catalog what was going on because this founder was just not having it, right? Like he comes asking for like a $7.5 million valuation, but then he goes and tells the sharks, no, this should be a $20 million valuation and I'm cutting you a deal. So as soon as, you know, Kevin starts asking for 10% equity for, you know, $300,000, the founder doesn't even blink. He's just like, no way. The company's growing 28% a month. Something that Peter, our guest shark, was like, how are you growing this fast? So I don't know. I just felt that like the whole thing was like a little suspicious. I was like, yeah, uh, Here, here's <laughs> what we know for certain. Um, and some of the context on this, I think. Number one is that he is growing super fast because he is good at direct consumer digital marketing on Facebook and Google. But it is a constrained audience size because of the price point that he's at. And those platforms, you just are going to get audience fatigue over time. And so although he's growing very, very fast right now, that is going to at some point flatten out. And that might not be for two, three, four years. I actually don't know like what the penetration he's getting right now into that audience looks like. But at some point that will peter off and he will need a new way to acquire customers if he's going to keep growing in that segment. He's crushing it on TikTok. Is he crushing it on TikTok? That's great mm. for him. That makes me really happy. <laughs> but here's here's the issue is that he's asking for basically like a uh, 0.75 forward revenue multiple valuation for his company. He's asking for a 4x EBITDA multiple. Uh, the problem is there are like really well established D2C brands that are publicly traded way below that. So I pulled some comps. So it, it's interesting because he's like D2C is incredible. Like it's the best. We're one of the fastest growing D2C brands. Well, the truth is D2C has gotten absolutely murdered in the last year uh, because all of the things that everyone thought was going to pay off about D2C just aren't panning out. So if you look at Warby Parker. What an incredible brand, right? Like they've gone beyond just digital. They've got these stores. They're doing all this stuff. They have basically like a $1.9 billion market cap. They're trading on like 3X, but they're losing money. Their EBITDA multiple is negative 17. And Stitch Fix has an EBITDA multiple basically of negative 3X. And so like he's asking for a much higher valuation, I think, than like publicly available comps related to D2C because the D2C market has just gotten so crushed because it's actually really hard to acquire customers on D2C. And everyone just knows that when you get to the end of that initial runway of acquiring customers, it's really hard to keep growing. So just so I can also wrap my head around it, like what is EBITDA and why does it matter? Oh, EBITDA is uh, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. EBITDA. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nerd alert. There's a lot of financial like magic you can do related to like, well, I'm going to buy some asset and I'm going to depreciate it over time. And that's going to make my earnings look better. It's like a, co a, a pure look at how good a business is. And an EBITDA multiple is comparing the valuation of a company to its EBITDA. And if it's negative, that's particularly bad. I just went to business school. Yeah, I know. I was just like <laughs> writing notes. <laughs> Every day on Shark Tank. Even though we had some sharks that were clearly very skeptical, ultimately there was a joint deal where Peter and Mark offered $300,000 for 10% stake and then a $700,000 credit line. And I think it's going to learn a lot uh, from, from both of those sharks. So before we close out on Collar & Co., I know it's divisive, John. And Leslie, I know there's some love there, but would you invest in this company? Yes, <clears throat> I would. Inv I would invest in the company at the valuation that Peter and Mark got, uh, because it essentially was very close to the Stitch Fix valuation. And so I think if you like get it close to something like that, that ef effectively values it, I think he's going to sell a lot of uh, Franken shirts. Uh, and I, you know, I, I would. I'd want to make some money on that if I could. Last in the tank, we have Boost Oxygen, and boyo, oh, was this one an interesting one. So Rob and Mike come out looking to boost a life essential because, you know, oxygen is really critical to, to living, you know, and uh, <laughs> Fun fact. So the, the goal here is to make compressed oxygen as available as water bottles. But note, it's not a medical device. 
It's claiming to improve the quality of life, though. And as part of the pitch, the founders made each of the sharks breathe into this like contraption container where they were all sort of like huffing into this machine, <laughs> immediately started coughing. Uh, but Boost Oxygen is asking for a $1 million investment for a 5% equity stake, valuing their, their company at $20 million. Barbara was like, I'm immediately out. I'm out. <laughs> but if this pitch was to you, what do we think of Boost Oxygen? Isn't Barbara always immediately out, though? Like, have we even <laughs> done of, an episode <laughs> where Barbara threw herself in? I mean, she's just strategic, right? <laughs> she's a surgeon. Probably not. This was the episode where she said, More importantly, I saw a beach house last week that was exactly a million dollars. And it was beautiful. Uh, what and beach? Oh, it was cheap. And I'm not telling you because he'll probably try to overbid me. But here's the skinny. I'd much rather have that beach house for the million dollars, so I'm out. That line stuck out to me as just like <laughs> classic barbs. I it saw was so a funny. beach house. I'd rather be there. <laughs> and Kevin was like, oh, where was the beach house? She's like, I'm not telling you. You'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that this was a joke in the movie Spaceballs, <laughs> and I am delighted to see it actually making its way to the mainstream. I wish that it was actually just in an aluminum can, just like in Spaceballs, <laughs> so that you could just crack it open and breathe it in. Uh, I don't know. Like, th it sounds like they have a very clear demographic. Like, they're trying to get it to people who uh, participate in a whole bunch of activities, particularly at elevations like skiing. It sounds like they're already selling a decent amount of this. They did six, six and a half million in revenue last year. They're going to do like a million and a half in net profit this year. So, like, they've got the basics of their business working out. And they're just literally trying to figure out if they can get distribution on it to get it into every ski resort in the world. And, you know, everybody pushed back immediately. Oh, it's got to be like D to C. No, this is this is like a total impulse purchase. You're mm -hmm. at the mountain and you're like, oh, oxygen, how much? You're like 40 bucks. You're like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, this will be that. fun. Drink yeah. it up. Yeah. I'm going to hit just, that. Yeah. It's definitely like, I'm going to get a beer in my oxygen. And yeah. Totally. You can see people double fisting. Look at us. We agree. John and I agree on this. <laughs> Look at us. <laughs> I think their valuation was a little high. I assume that they came in that way to just try and negotiate down. But uh, I'm surprised as many sharks dropped out as they did, because it's actually a good business that it feels like if you just put more money in, like you'd get distribution on and get money back. And they tend to really like businesses like that. Yeah, it was super interesting. I can't remember who said it, but one of the problems they had with it is trying to educate consumers on problems they don't know they have. As somebody who like lived in Colorado, travels to Colorado a lot, like it, it is a big difference when you are working out when you are walking upstairs, like you get really humbled. Um, I've never personally tried the oxygen. I'm probably like too cocky and I'm like, oh no, I don't need it. But I do think it really does help people. And it's actually really interesting when I was kind of looking at this brand, like there are a lot of people who are really grateful for this, whether it is for their elderly parents who they keep it at their house um, during COVID when all of that was like when breathing was really difficult. And so I think it was one of those episodes <laughs> where they came in and we were all kind of Wait, what? Just the idea of you classifying the period of COVID as when breathing was very difficult. <laughs> it was. It's like it's I've never heard it described that way, but it's true. That was a hard period of breathing for those for of us everyone. around the world. That was a tough breathing year uh, for all of us. Um, <laughs> but also too, like professional sports, most people are even Cuban brought that up. Like they're keeping this stuff to really give you kind of that quick jolt. I was really interested to see too how many people who had mentioned that this like had really had a positive effect on their life. So it sounds like it's kind of like a bit of a niche product still though, right? Like I do think, so it was Rohan that was the guest shark that yes. had mentioned that like there's an education problem here. It is a niche product, but I disagree with the sentiment that it's an educational sale. Mm. Does anybody who's listening today not understand that oxygen helps you breathe better? <laughs> I just think it's not something people normally like could see it solve a problem. I don't stock up on oxygen, you know? Yeah. Well, you don't stock up on oxygen today because you don't know you can buy oxygen today. Fair point. Well made. <laughs> I think I would struggle in any normal context to think that boost oxygen would really better my life. And as a practical purchaser, I don't think I'd be like, yeah, my 
performance to sit at my desk and do my day job is going to be greatly increased with boost oxygen. But, you know, if I am on the slopes and I feel like I'm getting altitude sickness or getting lightheaded, like that would be a time when there's a very specific need that I could think it would actually solve. Uh, Leslie, I don't think you're in the target market for it, honestly. I think this is a Silver Fox product. I think it is for the Silver Foxes of the world. And I think it is for that you have a whole group of men and, and women, more men probably than women, who are really obsessed with biohacking their bodies right now. And they've been professionally successful uh, during a really great period of the economy. And so they have excess cash to spend on bettering their life. And when they go skiing because they're like 55 years old, like it's harder than it used to be. And so they want to hit that oxygen. I think they're just going to sell a ton of it if they can just focus their marketing on reaching the right demographic, having it in all the right locations. Like this to me is literally just all about doing a couple big deals with the biggest ski resorts everywhere mm -hmm. and largely getting all those people to, to purchase that and then continuing to market to those people. And like gyms and altitude could be an interesting one mm -hmm. because you if you- a CrossFit partnership. Yeah. That's fair. So there were a couple, Rohan, Barbara, Lori, and honestly, Mark went out really quickly, but we did get one offer on the table and that was Kevin. So Kevin- uh, made an offer for a million dollars as a loan at 7.5% interest for three years and then a 6.25% equity stake. And there was one offer on the table. That's where the deal was made. So ultimately, though, Boost Oxygen did walk away with a deal on Shark Tank. I was so confused by this. <laughs> Tell me more. I don't, I don't know why they took the offer. It was not a good offer for them. They don't need to take a loan out right now. Like the way that I think of it is they went in and they asked for a million dollars for 5% of their company. They took an agreement to pay Mr. Wonderful about $150,000 over the next few years and give him seven and a half percent of the company. I'm just so confused on how that actually happened. Seems like they just were just dead set on they wanted a shark. They wanted someone who could just solve a bunch of their distribution and placement problems for them and we're just willing to give up a ton of value for it. So do we think it's still a company, Boost Oxygen? Oh, yeah. I like I've I've seen this. I've seen it in the mountains. So if you thought that Boost Oxygen was out of gas, don't hold your breath. The company is very much still serving some uh, tasty quality air in a can. Since the Shark Tank, they've added multiple items to their roster. So now you can get oxygen, but now you can get different scented types of air. So you can get your peppermint, your is it eucalyptus. Scented? scented or flavored in this context? I kind of you know, think it's flavored. That's fair, but you're breathing, so smell. It's, scent it's scented. Scented and flavored. Aromatherapy? And aren't taste yes. and smell really the same thing, Leslie? Touché. I mean, you have to have them together. Anyways, off track. Anyway, <laughs> as of June 2021, they were estimated to be worth $15 million and are projected to hit over $20 million of revenue this year. So they definitely continue to build their oxygen empire one half at a time. As we close out this episode, whether it's a certain shark, certain entrepreneur, maybe a Franken clothing renaissance, uh, who do we think won the episode? I went practical with this one and I said, Justin, the uh, entrepreneur of Collars and Co. I think for all the back and forth, like he was just savage and I have feelings about that, but like he made it out with a deal and I was just like really shocked that he was able to win a deal. So I called him the winner. He made it out with a fair deal too, yeah, which is like, after... it's not like he like got gutted in the process to get the deal. He actually got like a very fair deal for his business, I think. Um, I think Kevin, who made the side comment to Barbara about marrying her so he could be rich instead of taking a deal. Still, the smoothness and founder. the quickness of that line and how much she loved it, it was a very special moment for me. Today's episode was written and produced by Matthew Brown. And guys, go ahead and tell your friends, your family, your lifelong nemesis neighbor down the street, whoever, tell them about another bite. After all, word of mouth is the greatest podcast gift there is. I'm Jory Monroe, and see you next week for another bite.